How cold are the permanently shadowed craters on the moon? Why does dark matter form a halo and not a flattened disk? And how long until there's a war for the moon? All this and more in this week's question show. It's time for the question show your questions, my answers wherever you are across my channel. If a question pops in your brain, just write it down in the YouTube comments down below, I will gather them up and I will answer them here. All right, let's get into the questions. Colum Wilst 1810. How cold does it get in the shadows on the moon on the sunlit side? Does it get as cold as on the night side of the moon? The moon is a very strange environment. It's actually a lot more hostile in terms of temperature than even Mars. I mean, we think about how Mars temperatures dip down to minus 100 Celsius and they get up as high as 100 or 20 degrees at the equator. That's nothing compared to the moon. So if you're in the day side of the moon, then temperatures can get up to 121 degrees Celsius. If you're just sitting on the surface of the moon and the sun is up, you can get up to 121. And then as soon as your spot on the moon goes into shadow, then the temperature will drop and it gets down to about minus 133 Celsius. So do the math. You've got 121 in the daytime to negative 133. That's like 150. No, that's 250 degrees Celsius change from day to night. And it happens very fast. There's no atmosphere on the moon. And so the moment the sun goes down, things start to cool down. You're gonna have a little bit of leftover radiation coming from the regolith around you, but pretty quick, you're gonna get to that incredibly cold temperature. But that is not as cold as it gets on the surface of the moon. The coldest place is on these eternally shadowed craters on the moon. Now you asked just about how cold does it get in the shadows on the moon? And that is that number that minus 133. But there are these places at the South Pole and a little at the North Pole, where the sun never comes into these shadows. And so the temperatures get dramatically colder. In fact, the coldest temperature that was ever measured on the surface of the moon was minus 246 Celsius. So that's a lot colder than even nighttime on the moon. And so this is one of the big reasons why it's believed that you've got these eternally shadowed craters on the moon containing large reserves of water ice, because at minus 246, the ice is solid like rock, there's no radiation that's hitting it to evaporate it away. And so in theory, if you can get into those regions, then you're gonna be able to address it. And this is the big reason why all of these spacecraft die as soon as you reach the lunar night, that you've got to have a spacecraft that can handle operating in above 100 degrees Celsius. And then the moment you go into shadow, then the temperature drops to minus 100 degrees Celsius or more. And we know that very, very cold temperatures are very bad for batteries. If you have, you know, you have a laptop battery, you have an electric bike, a car, they're very concerned with the temperature that your battery is going to go in. So if your really fancy batteries are in incredibly cold temperatures for two weeks, then they don't stand a great chance of being able to come back. But then you're probably wondering, um, what about the permanently lit parts? of the moon. And in fact, there probably aren't any places on the moon that are always in eternal sunlight. There's this idea of the the peaks of eternal sunlight, that there are these mountains that are the opposite of those craters. And the problem is the craters can go really deep. And so you can have these places where the sunlight never gets in, but the peaks don't go that high. And they they're not dependably in full sunlight. And probably the best place on the moon is Shackleton Crater, which is one of these craters that is right at the very south pole of the moon. And there are places around Shackleton Crater that are almost in eternal sunlight for about 40 hours or so. It can be dark in those craters it all depends on sort of where the moon is in its orbital inclination compared to the sun and so on. But there's just no place on the moon where you can ever be in eternal sunlight. And so uh, it's a tough environment. And you can see why all of these spacecraft are having such a hard time, not just landing on the moon, but also just surviving for a single lunar night, which makes the fact that slim lander came back so incredible that it was able to handle that temperature variation. So good job, everybody at JAXA. 
I'm sure you noticed the Star Trek planet name that appeared above my shoulder on that first question. And you're wondering, what's that for? Well, this is a way for you to vote to tell us what you thought was the best question of the week. And so last week, everybody voted for Jesus Solis. If satellites are the first products being used to build the space economy, what is the next product? It was a great question. And I'm glad everybody enjoyed the answer. So I'm going to answer a bunch of questions in this episode, a different Star Trek planet name is going to appear above my shoulder, wait till the end of the episode, and then just put the name of that Star Trek planet name in the comments down below. We'll also have references down in the show notes, so you can see what all the names are. All right. Don't forget to vote. JMZ604. If the regular matter in our galaxy flattened out into a rough disk, why did the dark matter remain as a rough sphere? So astronomers think while the galaxy, the Milky Way, for example, is in this flattened disk in sort of the same way that a solar system is in a flattened disk, the halo of dark matter that surrounds the Milky Way is more like a sphere. And you might be wondering if the same forces are going on that you've got this this galaxy that is rotating and all of the gas and dust and all the stars are going into this flattened disk. Why isn't the dark matter doing the same thing? And part of the problem is that whatever dark matter is, I mean, still, we don't know what dark matter is, right? So so whenever you say like, why does dark matter behave like such and such? Well, you don't know what it is. But one of the characteristics that dark matter probably has is that it doesn't interact not only with regular matter, but it probably doesn't interact with itself except for gravity. And so particle physicists, they give a term for this, they call it the cross section of the particle. And when you think about just regular stuff, atoms, clouds of hydrogen gas, that as this, this cloud is swirling around all of these particles of hydrogen are in this giant cloud, and they are bumping into each other. And as they bump into each other, they start to lose some of this, this momentum that's carrying them around, and the whole thing is able to start flattening out. Another example is like when you have a black hole, you have a black hole, material is trying to fall into the black hole, it maybe it's too much material, so the black hole can't feed on it. And so it starts to form this cloud around the black hole, but then these particles are bumping into each other, and they get flattened out into this disk. Dark matter probably behaves in a very different way. Because it has no cross section, you could take a cloud of dark matter, you could spin it up, and you're not going to get that same kind of interactions between the particles that cause it to flatten out into this larger cohesive mass. Every individual dark matter particles on its own journey, and isn't going to be interacting and bouncing into other particles. And you know, a lot of people ask this question, like, would dark matter go into black holes? And if it is a particle, sure, it's going to go into the black hole, but it's not going to form this accretion disk around the black hole in the same way that regular matter does. It's going to have gravitational interactions with all of the particles that are around the black hole and the black hole itself and so on, but it's not going to bonk into each other to then fall down into the black hole. And so it's that same idea, you're not getting that that interaction, that friction between the dark matter particles. And so you get a more spherical halo shape. Although I mean, the actual shape is still under our, you know, is it is it more like a egg? Um, is it blobs and clumps that are orbiting around the galaxy that are providing this additional mass to the galaxy? You know, this is all still part of the work that astronomers are doing to figure out exactly what's going on with dark matter. Obi one celery, are we alone in the universe? Fraser gave the perfect politician answer. I have to say I was disappointed. I was expecting Fraser to put his love of science before his reputation. What reputation? I'm a journalist, you know, if you got like scientists, journalists, so uh, I, I have no reputation to protect. Um, now, the, I think this question was like a couple of weeks ago, and someone asks me, are we alone in the universe? And the answer was we have no idea. And it was like the, the point was just to give a really quick, snappy answer and then move on. Now, those of you who watch the channel, you know that I have a sort of deeper, more nuanced view of whether or not we're alone in the universe. But I think that we don't know is a perfectly viable answer to give to a question where there is no scientific consensus on the answer so far. What is dark matter? We don't know. What is dark energy? We don't know. Is there life in the universe? We don't know. 
Why, what happens after you die? We don't know. Where did the universe come from? We don't know. It's okay to say, we don't know to an answer. You're not being a politician. You're answering the question with the most honesty you possibly can. Because as soon as you give an answer, is there life in the universe? Uh, yeah, I think so. Well, how do you know? What's your evidence? Well, my evidence is that it just seems like there must be. That is not evidence. That's an opinion. That's like, I like vanilla ice cream instead of strawberry ice cream. What is dark matter? Well, dark matter can't be some kind of particle. Oh, what's your evidence? Well, you know, it just feels wrong. It feels like scientists have made this up. What kind of answer is that? So, and I think that people are uncomfortable with hearing the answer, I don't know. Now, for me, when I hear the answer, I don't know, that's a person being honest, a person saying that I have not accumulated enough information to form an intelligent position on this matter. And so for the sake of transparency and honesty, I'm just going to admit my ignorance in this situation. Um, and for me, being a journalist doing this job for as long as I have, I find that I know less than I thought I did over time. And I understand very carefully about which are the things that I can that I think there is a scientific consensus on and the things that there aren't. And so uh, it's, it's, it's weird to me for someone to hear the answer I don't know, and to be disappointed. Like, educate me on the true answer, provide the evidence. And the second there is an overwhelming evidence that gives the information that I will gladly change my mind. You know, I believe that we're alone in the universe, but I don't have evidence that tells us that. Therefore, the answer that I have to give is that I don't know, and I can't wait to be wrong. So uh, yeah, yeah, it's not a politician answer. It's an honest answer, which is the opposite of a politician, right? Politicians going to give you an answer and they're going to justify it and they're going to they're going to give you a bunch of uh, mumbo jumbo magic tricks to distract you. And no, we don't know. I don't know. I don't think anybody does. That's okay. Akshay B. How far away are we from a war for the moon? There is no reason to claim the moon and then want need to defend the moon. There is only downside. If you try to claim the moon and you say the moon is ours, that the moment you do that, then you're going to you're gonna make other nations on Earth a little grumpy. And you'd be like, wait a minute, didn't you sign didn't we all sign the outer space treaty? And we said that nobody can own the moon. And now you're saying that you do now, obviously, you know, it's just a treaty and it's barely enforceable. But still, you know, it's it's kind of a jerk move to say that you now own the moon. So you're going to start with that. And then what are you going to get? So now you've pissed off all of your neighbors, you've pissed off everybody on Earth, saying that you own the moon, everyone's really mad about it. And so what do you get for this claim of the moon? Nothing. You, you, you can barely you know, nobody we saw what happened with multiple spacecraft just barely being able to reach the surface of the moon upside down tumbled over with many spacecraft dying as they try to make this just like step one land on the moon, not to mention uh, gathering resources from the moon, which there aren't very many. I mean, there's really almost nothing that you can't get on the moon that you can't you know, you just get on Earth. Like people said, you can get helium three, you can get helium three on Earth, it's maybe not as concentrated, but also you don't have to go to the moon to get it. So uh, th th there's no value in going to the moon. And it's sort of like there's no value in claiming Antarctica. Like, what are you going to get? You're gonna be Lord of the Penguins, you're gonna be you're gonna have a lot of snow and ice, which you can make in a refrigerator. Obviously, if you really could dig down below the snow and ice and start mining on Antarctica, then maybe you could start making some money. But you could do that anywhere else on Earth. Why try to start with Antarctica? And that's one of the big reasons why 
it, Antarctica is is part of the Antarctica Treaty because it's a very special place, very sensitive environment. There's no money to be made. So people are fine with not anybody trying to own it. And it's the same thing with the moon. There's nothing you can get from the moon that you can't just get down here on Earth. And so so there's no reason so you've already pissed off all your friends. There's no benefit of going to the moon. And now you got to defend it. Like what, what, what are you going to do? Are you going to send spacecraft filled with space Marines to the surface of the moon? Are the spacecraft going to flip upside down? Are their landing legs going to break and they're going to fall over and then the space Marines are going to tumble out? And then what are they going to do there on the surface of the moon? It's going to wait for somebody who is going to try to take your helium three mines away from you. So how far away are we from the moon? I, I would say conservatively forever. Um, yeah, I'm just going to go with forever. Uh, but you know, if, if something changes, I'll let you know, but for now, I don't think there will ever be a war for the moon. Rockwa, what are you obsessed with? Well played Rockwa. This is of course, one of the questions that I ask people that I interview them. And this came fairly new, I guess within the last six months, year or so. Um, and it came from me realizing that when I'm interviewing a scientist, they're not thinking about the work that they've just published in a research journal. In many cases, that is old news to them. They published a preprint six months ago, a year ago, and then they got it into a journal and then the journal accepted it and then it's been published and then there's a press release and there's a giant delay from when they thought about the idea to, to when they're talking to me and they've moved on, but the, the, you know, we're, they're essentially describing the research that they've just published. They're not going to talk about the, the next research, the future research, but I can get a hint of what comes next, what the future holds by asking them what they're obsessed about. And, and so I find it really interesting. It gives me a psychic prediction about what's going to come in the future. You know, imagine you could interview, I don't know, Christopher Nolan and ask him what he's obsessed with. And you realize that he's giving you the plot for his next movie. And so that would be really cool. So what am I obsessed with? Man, so my one of the things every month, we do a special patron only question show plug for the Patreon, uh, patreon.com slash universe today. Um, and I spend the first probably half hour talking about what I'm obsessed with. And so that changes every month. Like right now at the time that we're recording, and you've seen a couple of these, these episodes, I'm really fascinated by solar sails, laser sails, um, in situ resource utilization. How can we make stuff in space from stuff in space? And I'm also really interested in the direct observation of exoplanets going beyond the transit method, the radio velocity method to actually being able to directly image planets. I'm really fascinated about what we can discover because right now we only see about 1% of the exoplanets that are out there when they happen to pass directly in front of their star. But that is not the vast majority of the planets. Most of them are going to be in just any random configuration compared to the star. And also the planets that are probably going to be the most interesting, the earth like planets orbiting around sun like stars, they take, let's say 300 plus days to go in orbit around the star. And so you have to not only get this moment where the, the star and the planet perfectly line up, you've got to wait a year to see that second transit, and you got to wait another year to get a confirmation. But if there's some kind of direct imaging system where you could just take a picture of the star system, delete the sun, delete the star, and then see all the planets orbiting around that star, that would be amazing. And that's what the habitable worlds observatory is going to do. That's in theory, what the extremely large telescope is going to do. And we're entering this new era of direct imaging of exoplanets, and I am all for it. So that's what I'm obsessed with right now. But I guarantee like by the time you watch this show, what I'm obsessed with will have changed.
If you want to support the work we do at Universe Today, consider joining our Patreon club. Your support lets us have a minimum of ads and no sponsorship messages. Patrons get no ads on universetoday.com for life. Want the extra parts of the live stream that aren't in this edited version? You can sign up for a special patron-only podcast feed and get the overtime segments, as well as other special behind-the-scenes episodes, including our monthly patron-only question show that's like three hours long. Thanks to everyone who has already subscribed and welcome to the recent newcomers. Randall LaPlante. Chris Ryan, Carsamir, Krista Maria Foot, Chris Stockbridge, Jessica Marshall, Carrie S, Brian and Laurel, Szymanski, Jeremy Holland, Powell Pewick, and Spencer. Join the club at patreon.com slash universe today. Ian Nye, what do you think is going on with Dark Matter? Any trends that you've noticed? We're in a really interesting time right now for the search for Dark Matter because this is one of the largest mysteries in astronomy today. Astronomers would really love to know what is the cause of dark matter? What is this invisible mass that is pulling on all of these galaxies that is causing these weird rotation curves that is changing the structure of the cosmic microwave background radiation that's causing clumpings of galaxies that's causing gravitational lensing. Like there's all of this evidence that this dark matter is out there, but nobody knows what the actual particle is what the mechanism is. And so there's two main fronts where astronomers and physicists really are trying to get to the bottom of this one is, can we make better observations to pin down the characteristics of dark matter at the larger scales, try to confirm some theories, try to disprove other theories, get to a point where you're left like all that remains has to be the answer. And then on the particle side, people are building ever more interesting particle accelerators, particle experiments where they're attempting to capture dark matter particles directly and, and be able to see their interactions, even if it's incredibly rare, kind of like how neutrinos work. And, and where we are right now today is that many of the big astronomical projects are about to begin. So one of the ones that we've been reporting on is the Euclid mission. This is this mission that's doing an all sky survey of the entire universe over the course of six years, it's going to image the entire sky in both visible light and infrared and try to map out the distortions of gravity across the entire sky by all of the mass that is sort of squishing it. And because when you have say a galaxy, and then you have a blob of dark matter in front of it, the blob of dark matter acts like a natural lens that changes and distorts the shape of the galaxy. And so astronomers are going to be able to see and map all of these distortions across the entire sky. And that's going to be coming from the Euclid mission. And very similar work is going to be done with the Nancy Grace Roman telescope, which is launching very soon. And then there's another mission that's being launched by NASA called Sphere X, which is going to be kind of similar to the Euclid mission, and then you got the work on the ground from the Vera Rubin Observatory. And so when you add this all up together, you're going to get many separate instruments, which are all going to work together to really try and constrain dark matter. And that will eliminate a lot of ideas. And then on Earth, you've got a lot of really interesting experiments that are designed to test one specific possible aspect of of a dark matter particle to detect it moving, whether it's if dark matter might be axions or whether dark matter might be some other kind of non interacting particle. And then, you know, there's some really interesting work that's being done with the Gaia Observatory. Wow, did I just get a two for it? I just mentioned Vera Rubin and Gaia in the same question, you all get your bingo right there. Um, but the Gaia mission has been doing these observations of wide binary stars. And so people are thinking that this might be evidence for Mond, although other people are saying this is definitely not evidence for Mond. And so I mean, you can even see hardcore dark matter skeptics like Sabina Hossenfelder starting to come around to the particle idea of, of dark matter. So the trends are that astronomy and particle physics has caught up to the complexity of the challenge, and they've brought serious instruments to bear on this problem. And so now we got to wait for these experiments to run. And my hope is that we'll get a much better explanation coming out the other side of this. We might not get the answer, but that's fine. This is a mystery. It's unfolding. Enjoy the ride. Verador, speaking of solar sails, I'm wondering if we could catch up with Oumuamua with a solar sail probe of a very small payload. Solar sails are awesome. I just want to like preface everything that I'm about to say by first stating that solar sails are amazing. 
Now, the problem with solar sails is that they work less and less the farther you get away from the sun. And if the goal is to catch up with an interstellar object that is speeding away from the solar system, then you're going to need a propulsion system that goes very fast. And just like a straight up, if you launch a solar sail from here on Earth, you're going to get a little bit of boost leaving Earth orbit, but you're not going to get fast enough to catch up with Oumuamua. You need some other trick. So there are a couple of tricks. One is that you use a laser. So you point your laser at your solar sail, and now it becomes a laser sail and you can accelerate the, the sail. And depending on the mass of your solar sail, you can accelerate it fast enough to be able to catch up with Oumuamua, assuming you've got the aim right. Um, you don't want to get very close. And like this is the idea that's been proposed to send tiny spacecraft to Proxima Centauri at 20% the speed of light. So you could absolutely catch up with Oumuamua. Now, any one spacecraft is probably going to have problems. Maybe, you know, your aim is going to be off, but you send a swarm of maybe a, a thousand one meter across so laser sail powered uh, solar sails to catch up with Oumuamua and do a flyby of it. The other option is you actually weirdly go inwards to the solar system. So if you can get really close to the sun, you can do a sort of special kind of maneuver where you're able to get close to the sun, accelerate your spacecraft, and then you slingshot out the other side away from the sun, then you could try to chase down Oumuamua, but it's going to be going really fast. That's probably not going to work. The other idea is mag sails and electric sails. So in addition to the light that is coming off of the sun, there's also the steady stream of particles, the solar wind, and that you can have a spacecraft that has like this giant net around it, and you run an electric current through that net, you interact with the particles that are coming from the sun, and that gives you a boost. And so that has been proposed as a way to chase down Oumuamua. But you, you don't really need a solar sail like we have the technology today to chase down Oumuamua. If we wanted to spend the money, you take a Falcon Heavy, you fill it up with fuel, you have a really powerful upper stage, and then you have a teeny tiny little spacecraft, a chase spacecraft, and then you fire it off and away it goes. Maybe you do one of these orbits around the sun to get going faster. Oberth maneuver, and then you're able to chase down within, oh, I don't know, 50 years, you could catch up with Oumuamua and do a flyby of Oumuamua. And there's been even more interesting exotic ideas for how you could potentially do a, even a sample return mission from Oumuamua, where, for example, you could take an RTG, which is the kind of power system that's on Curiosity Perseverance, on the Voyagers, like it lasts for a long time, produces electricity ongoing, and then you just bolt on an ion engine with enough propellant. And then all it is is really engine, it's got a nuclear battery that is providing electricity, and that it could accelerate and give you enough speed to not only reach a Muamua, maybe send down a sample return, and then return back to Earth with that. So there's a lot of ideas that we could use. But right now, the astronomical community is saying Oumuamua is gone. Like yes, if we wanted to spend 10s of billions of dollars, we could chase down Oumuamua. But instead, let's just wait for the next interstellar object to pass through the solar system. There's a couple of ideas in the works that will be an interstellar interceptor. So you've got this spacecraft that will loiter around, say, the Earth Sun L2 Lagrange point, like where James Webb is, wait for an interstellar object on the right trajectory to pass through the solar system. And then it fires its engines and goes for an interception to do a flyby of that object. Right now, we only know of two interstellar objects that have been found so far. But when the Vera Rubin telescope comes online, it's going to find dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of these interstellar objects passing through the solar system. And so one of them is going to be on the perfect trajectory for a minimal amount of fuel for an inexpensive spacecraft, you can do a flyby, maybe you could figure out a way to do a lander, an orbiter, and learn a tremendous amount about an object that came from another star system. Now, I mean, Oumuamua is obviously very special, uh, weird, uh, it would be great to know specifically more information about that. But my guess is that after a while, we'll see enough of these objects passing through the solar system that, you know, one's as good as another.
RM. What are the particles that are theoretically created during the process of black hole evaporation? Electrons, quarks, complete protons, neutrons? The vast majority of the particles that are going to be theoretically evaporating from black holes are just photons, just radiation, light at different wavelengths. When the black hole is very large, you're going to see very low energy photons. And then as the black hole gets less and less massive, smaller, the radiation coming from it is going to get hotter and hotter. Eventually, you'll get this final flash of gamma radiation, and then the black hole will be gone. And I guess there's the potential for other particles as well. But the vast majority is going to be photons. Grigor Kayasari, what caused the Big Bang? We have no idea. Bryce Rowley, how do solar panel satellites transfer energy down to Earth? So one of the possible applications for the future of space exploration is that we can build space power satellites, where like down on the surface of the Earth, solar panels only work during the daytime, they don't work at night. But if you could put your solar panels into space, then you wouldn't have to deal with weather, you wouldn't have to deal with the day night cycle, you would just have full maximum sunlight falling on your panels all the time. The tricky problem is that they're out in space. And so now you have to get that power from space back down to Earth. And so the main proposal is that you would do that with microwaves. And this has been tested, that people have been able to test sending microwaves for long distances being able to transfer power. It's very inefficient, but it does theoretically work. And so you would have the power generating satellites flying above the earth, they would be beaming their power down to the surface of the earth to some collection station that would be taking that and then converting that into electricity. But you know, th that's in theory. And every few years, we get an announcement of a different organization that is planning to do, you know, a paper about the feasi a feasibility study of space power, and it never goes anywhere. And that's just because right now, putting solar panels down on Earth, even though they're not as efficient, it's they're just dramatically cheaper than launching them into space. And so you just don't need to send things to space while well, we still have parking lots and buildings that you can put solar panels on top of and the cost per watt just goes down year after year after year. The other mild issue is that when you have a satellite in space, you're capturing sunlight that maybe wouldn't have hit the Earth, you know, it's the stuff that's going to fly above or to the side of the Earth. And you're now beaming that towards the Earth. And so you're going to be increasing the heat budget of planet Earth. Now, I'm not sure it's a, a gigantic input. And when you consider how you could be reducing your reliance on other greenhouse gases, then maybe you can make the whole thing work out net net that it's actually a more effective use of our energy budget on Earth. But I doubt that any of these solar power projects will work because it's so expensive, because capturing solar energy down on Earth is so inexpensive. It just never makes going to make any kind of feasible sense. The thing that you do want to do, though, is beam power from space to space. So we talked about earlier on that there's those permanently shadowed craters on the moon. And if you're going to want to have your rover exploring the bottom of one of these craters at negative 250 degrees Celsius, you're going to need a way to provide it with electricity, you're going to need a way for it to be able to keep itself warm in those cold temperatures. And so you have a satellite that is orbiting overhead that is collecting sunlight, it's then using microwaves to beam down and this very concentrated beam down to your rover, and your rover has a collector, and it's able to soak up all of that energy and to be able to keep doing its work. And so I think we're going to see applications of using space power where you're beaming power from space to space, maybe to places like Antarctica or the Arctic Circle. How can the people in Antarctica get power in the middle of a long winter in Antarctica? You beam them power from space. So, so there are some potential applications for it here on Earth, places where just other forms of power just are totally infeasible. But uh, I think for the longest time, we're going to see applications of space power used in space. But that's how. Andrew Fish, has anyone postulated that dark energy will eventually decline and be exhausted like known energy? If it has increased over time, can't the reverse be true? I mean, we don't know what dark energy is. But dark energy appears to be just 
part of space itself. That, you know, if you have a cubic meter of space, and you remove all of the mass, so there's no atoms whatsoever, there's no particles buzzing through this cubic meter, and you remove all the energy, there's no photons going through, there's nothing, there still is something. And that is that there is still this background fields that are oscillating in space itself. And so the discovery that there is some kind of energy that is inherent in space itself just falls from that naturally. And, you know, what implications that had on the universe, I think was a big surprise. But you know, when you talk to astronomers, and particle physicists, and you say, you know, is there's this inherent repulsive force in space itself, they're like, yeah, that, that's what you would expect. So as long as you get more space, then you're going to get more of that energy. But the question is, does the amount of energy inherent in each cubic meter of space increase or decrease over time? The assumption is that it just remains exactly the same that if you have one meter of space, it's going to last for billions, trillions, quadrillions of years, and it will always be having the same amount of this expansive energy that is coming out of this cubic meter. But one of the big questions that astronomers wanted to know is, is this amount changing over time that if it does increase, for example, that's how you get these weird outcomes like the big rip. And if it decreases, that gives you other weird outcomes, I guess, with a you still get an expansion in the universe, but it wouldn't be accelerating anymore. So right now, it's too soon for us to know. And you know, I talked about earlier about how there's all these interesting experiments that are being done to understand the true nature of dark matter. And the same thing is happening with dark energy, there's a bunch of interesting experiments that are being done to help astronomers understand the true nature of of dark energy, the same spacecraft, Euclid, Nancy Grace Roman, Vera Rubin, they're all going to be doing this work to try and help us understand what impact dark energy has been having on the universe itself. And it could very well be that dark energy on per cubic meter of space is increasing or decreasing. And both of those would be really interesting outcomes would be surprising to discover and would have deep implications for the future of the universe. Basil Curie, what's your take on large solar flares? Is the risk overblown or unappreciated? I think I've gone on record several times that that solar flares are probably the largest threat that we face from space. Asteroids, I mean, they're scary. But the chance that an asteroid is actually going to crash into the Earth and cause wild scale damage that happens on a tens of 1000s, if not millions of years schedule. And we saw with the DART mission, we can push an asteroid out of its trajectory. And so now, suddenly, for the first time in the history of planet Earth, the planet can defend itself from asteroids, black holes passing through the solar system, very rare chance supernova going off in our vicinity, there aren't any that are in a dangerous distance to us. So we don't really have to worry about that. But yeah, really big solar flares happening while we have this highly interconnected electrical system with satellites in orbit would be a very bad day. And we've seen events like the Carrington event, which happened in the 1800s, that lit telegraph poles on fire, people saw auroras near the equator, it was pretty exciting. And yet we didn't have this technological interconnected society. But we've seen examples say in Montreal, there was a solar flare that took down a chunk of the electrical grid. And that wasn't a really bad one. And there have been events in the tree records that show uh, solar flares that were dramatically more powerful than the Carrington event. So every few hundred years, we will probably get a solar flare that hits the earth with enough power to cause a severe disruption to our planet's electrical grid, or whatever, you know, the side facing the sun. And then we will have a hundreds of billions, if not trillions of dollars worth of cleanup to do to swap out bad components, fix telephone lines that caught on fire. So yeah, yeah, I think it's a big problem. And scientists have gotten a lot better at predicting when damaging solar flares are on the way. 
and being able to help people at least know that we're an hour away from a bad solar flare. But we haven't made any changes to the just the raw infrastructure of of how society works to be able to prepare for this. So we now understand the scale of the problem. And now the question is, can we mitigate it? We can, I mean, there's no technological reason why we can't. The question is just do we have the will to do so? And can we think of other wide planet wide risks that require uh, a, you know, a serious solution to combat the problem, I think we can think of a bunch. So uh, we will behave towards solar flares exactly how we behaved towards other potential threatening planet wide issues. All right, those are all the questions that we got today. Thank you everyone who posted your questions into the YouTube comments and everybody who joined me for the live stream. We do the show every Monday at 5pm Pacific time right here on the YouTube channel, there should be a notification somewhere on the channel where you can see where the next one is going to be. Uh, so definitely come if you want to see the show is twice as long. It's about two hours long. We get into a ton more questions after we finish recording the main show. So if you want a even longer QA experience, come join the live show. Now I'm going to recommend another small YouTuber. But first, I'd like to thank our patrons. Thanks to Abe Kingston, Andrew M. Gross, Antonio Lofilara, David Giltonen, Dougie Stewart, Dustin Cable, Jeremy Mattern, Jordan Young, Josh Schultz, Mark Anstis, Paul Rohrbach, Stephen Krasaki, Stephen Feller Munley, and Vlad Shiplin, who support us at the Master of the Universe level, and all of our other patrons. All your support means the universe to us. Alright, so last week I asked everybody to give me your recommendations for YouTubers who are doing a great job who are just putting their heart into this. And yet for some reason, they just don't have a gigantic following and we're here to fix that. So this week, I want to recommend Nora's Guide to the Galaxy. I had a bunch of people recommend her channel and I hadn't seen it before. And she's great. Uh, she used to work at NASA JPL. She has a PhD in astronomy and astrophysics and has been doing a bunch of explainers, things like about binary planets, um, universal constants, uh, and also does various news segments. And, uh, you know, it's great to see somebody who has this technical knowledge and not just a journalist like me. Um, but the one that I really liked was she did a recent episode on flat rotation curves. This is one of the big pieces of evidence for the existence of dark matter. And when you see just how rock solid the observations are, like, you can't say dark matter is nothing. It's something we just don't know what it is. And so I thought her explainer on that was great. So definitely check out Nora's Guide to the Galaxy. She only has 4000 subscribers. So see if we can fix that. All right. Thanks, everyone for watching this week's episode. Thanks for all the questions. And we'll see you all next week.